We are speaking about our first subject, the pre-existence of Jesus Christ. We talked about his position over all creation. He's the revelation of the invisible God. He's the complete representation of the invisible God. He is the special reason for the creation. Firstborn. Doesn't mean he was born first. It's not from the standpoint of time, as is clear in the Bible, but prototokos, used nine times, is referring to his uniqueness, his specialness. And the fact is that all creation was designed for him. He's above it all. And we talked about his power to create all things. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. We talked about his providence in controlling everything. Uh, he upholds all things by the word of his power, Hebrews 1.3. Uh, he is sustaining all the laws of the universe, Colossians 1.17. And we've come now to his presence in Old Testament times, and we talked a lot to you about the importance of the word name. His name is above every name. We mentioned that even though you'll see in books the names of God, like Jehovah Rapha or El Shaddai or whatever, these are not really names like we use that word in English. They're not really titles. They speak of the character and attributes and activity of God. Uh, God said his name was Yahweh, or the Tetragrammaton, four letters that express uh, who God is. There are many qualities and attributes of him. The word name used 800 times in the Old Testament, 200 in the New, never in the plural, always in the singular. And uh, we're going to talk about the fact that um, Yeshua ben Yosef, Jesus, son of Joseph, who came into this world as a baby in Bethlehem, had always existed. Uh, he did not begin his existence when he became a baby in Bethlehem or when he was conceived in the womb of Mary. Uh, he is the eternal Son of God. And uh, we're going to uh, look into that wonderful, wonderful teaching in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, uh, today, and I hope it will be a blessing to you. All right, take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 34. <clears throat> Now, in dealing with the presence of the Messiah in the Old Testament, we're going to deal with four things. The evidence that God is more than one, that God can reveal himself as Father, Son, and Spirit. We're going to look at, first of all, a wonderful subject, the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord. The Hebrew term is Malak Yahweh. Malak. Now, Malak can also be translated messenger. So watch out when you read angel that your mind doesn't immediately go to somebody that looks more like a woman than a man and has wings and looks rather sweet and angelic. Um, not that they couldn't look that way, but I just doubt seriously they do. That's okay. You know, They're not women, they're men. But actually, they're really sexless. So, you know, I don't want to make a big deal over that. You know what I mean? But a lot of people sure do. They definitely are not like those cute little cherubs that we have all over our Victorian houses. Um, but, um, you know, those are cute, too. You know, I mean, come on. Let's don't ruin everybody's life. Uh, but anyway, uh, we're going to talk about the angel of the Lord. A malak is simply a messenger, one who is sent on a mission. It's interesting, uh, if you put it into Greek, you'd get apostello, which you have uh, the word to send, or apostle in English is just said from the word. An apostle is one who is sent, and in some respects can be an angel. In other words, a messenger. Is there a unique group of beings that God has created who we normally refer to as angels? Yes, of course. Cherubim, seraphim, some of the ranks and orders of those angels. Uh, there's a one angel mentioned as the archangel. Uh, that's Michael, the archangel. No, that's not Jesus Christ. In case you've heard a lot of JW talk, that's not Jesus Christ. Uh, Michael, 
um, bows the knee to Jesus Christ. Um, there's a book in the bookstores, secular bookstores, that uh, it's oh, it's beautiful. It talks about the seven angels of God, and it's it's really gorgeous, and they're all named there. And, and seven archangels, excuse me, there's a lot more angels, but it says the seven archangels. That comes from Jewish Talmudic literature. Uh, there is only one archangel according to the Bible, but uh, some of the fantasy uh, teaching that's in uh, the Talmud as well as in other writings comes up with more archangels. They think uh, Gabriel, meaning strength of God, is an archangel. But the Bible never says he is. Michael is called the archangel, which pretty well sell, settles it. He is an an or one of. He is the archangel. Uh, there is the angel also over the d- demons as well. His name is Satan. But uh, in looking at this, uh, I was down at uh, Mother's Kitchen in Newport Beach, which is kind of a health nutritional type place, you know. And it's kind of a, a little occultic and new age too. But anyway, I came in and here was this gigantic display on angels right in the doorway. Big sign and all these cute little cherubs around and books all over the place on angels and right in featuring was this huge, beautiful, multicolored seven archangels of God. So I opened it up and I looked at it and so forth. I told the uh, attendant at the counter, I said, is, is the manager available? I said, why? I said, well, there's a really big problem over here in this table. <laughs> so the manager came out and um, he said, what's the problem? I said, well, uh, this book, it's uh, it's not right. He says, it's not right. He says, no, there aren't seven archangels. There's only one. They got seven in here. Look, look for yourself. <laughs> he looked at me like, what's going on? And I said, besides, the best book on angels, uh, you don't even have here. <laughs> he said, really? He gets out his little pen. What was that? Um, book by Billy Graham. Ever heard of him? He wrote on angels. You, you need that book here, right here. I'd put it right in the center if I were you. Kind of feature it. Um, <laughs> By the way, he has a lot of other good books, too. He has a little simple one called Peace With God. We all need peace, don't we? Well, yeah, and now he's realizing I have a real serious weirdo here. You know. Well, there aren't seven archangels. There's only one. And Jesus is not an angel. But the cults are going to use what I'm now going to teach you in exactly the opposite way to prove that he's nothing but an exalted angel of God. That's how they do it. In uh, Psalm 34, just to show you some of the blessing of this, Psalm 37, 34, rather, verse 7, it says, The angel, the Hamalach of the Lord, Yahweh, encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth him or them. So here we've got one angel called the angel of the Lord encamping around everybody who fears him because it uses the plural. He delivers them. So whoever this one angel is, he's either moving real quick from person to person or he has the ability to be in more places at once than anyone else could be. In chapter 35, verse 5 and 6 of Psalms, Let them be as chaff, talking about the wicked, before the wind, and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery, and let the angel of the Lord persecute them. Why would David be referring to that? Why? Because in past Jewish history, before David's time, there's biblical record about the power and greatness of the angel of the Lord. In Zechariah chapter 12, Zechariah to show you one of the later prophets that proves the Bible's pretty well consistent on this subject. In Zechariah 12, 8, it says, not pretty well, it is consistent. Verse 8, in that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. This is talking about the battle of Armageddon. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David. And the house of God shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. You see, that phrase would remind the Jews of how the angel of the Lord led them, even in the wilderness, how he fought for them, how he 
uh, defeated their enemies. And now at the Battle of Armageddon, um, the prayer is that, or, or the statement is that the Lord will defend them. And even the most feeble Jew is going to be like the angel of the Lord, supernaturally empowered uh, to defend themselves against uh, all the attacks against them. And all the nations will be against them. In fact, verse 9 says that God will destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. The angel of the Lord appears 59 times. I think your notes say 50. 59 times. Um, however, the actual Hebrew words, Malach, Yahweh, appear only 57 of those times. I mean, what's two times to quibble about? You also have the term the angel of God appearing six times. The angel of God, not five, but six. Now, we're going to give you seven examples. And uh, hopefully these examples will demonstrate to you who the Malach Yahweh, the angel of the Lord, really is. Let's go, first of all, to Abraham in Genesis chapter 22. And believe me, folks, you need to get this material down. Uh, The cultists will really do a number against people with all these passages showing that uh, Jesus is not what we say he is. In Genesis 22, verse 11, you remember Abraham's ready to um, stretch forth his hand and kill his son Isaac. You say, how could he do that? Well, because as Hebrews 11 tells us, knowing that the promise of God was through Isaac, and Abraham had believed God, and it was counted him for righteousness, he actually believed that God, if he wanted him to kill him, would raise him immediately from the dead. He knew that because he didn't have any baby yet, so he knew that according to God's promise, Isaac would also have a son, and so he knew that uh, God would have to raise him from the dead. He was willing to kill that boy. And uh, it shows the great faith of Abraham, who's, who said that he did not waver through unbelief, but grew strong in the promise of God, fully persuaded that what God had promised he would perform. And Hebrews 11 points out that that was all a type and a picture of the death and resurrection of our Savior. Very interesting. But anyway, in 22.11, the angel of the Lord. Now, many times it says an angel. It is not significant in Greek as it is in Hebrew. Let me explain. This does not refer always to a definite article, but it does in this context. I'll show you why. In Greek, if I said the angel of the Lord, it does not necessarily mean that he's the only one. Uh, He could be the angel that we're talking about out of a group of angels. The definite article in Greek specifies or identifies uh, that noun. So uh, in Greek, it's not as significant. That's why many times it's just a normal angel when it says the angel of the Lord opened the door and Peter went out and so forth. But in the Old Testament, when you put the definite article in front of it, it's the one and only one angel of the Lord. And if it says just an angel or uses the plural, then you know it's a, another one of the created beings. But this is a very important point. The definite article. The angel of the Lord. Called unto Abraham out of heaven. Abraham, Abraham, he said, here am I. He said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Abraham lifts up his eyes, sees the ram, offers it, calls the name of the place uh, Jehovah Jireh. Uh, either to provide or to see. There's a flexibility there, I think probably provide, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided, uh, that the Lamb was provided for our sins. Anyway, look at verse 15. The angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time. You cannot miss this text, the details of it. The angel of the Lord did the calling. It was the second time, which means the first one we read was the angel of the Lord. And now he says, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, Yahweh. For because thou hast done this thing, has not withheld thy son, thine only son, in blessing, I will bless thee. Multiplying, I will multiply thee. Verse 18, In thy seed shall all the nations there be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Who is this one? 
Well, first of all, only one, according to the Bible, can swear by himself. Beautiful argument on that in Hebrews 6, 13 to 20 about the promise of God. He doesn't need to swear by anything else because there isn't anything else. By an a priori argument, he's the creator. He swore by himself. So his own character that he will not change and his word, which will not change, the Bible says by those two immutable things, it's established because in the mouth of two witnesses, every word's established. In the case of God, it is his word. He has never lied. It's impossible for God to lie. And his character, I am Yahweh, I change not. Uh, Malachi 3.6. So what you have here is a powerful statement to the deity of the angel of the Lord. He's actually claiming to be Yahweh. By myself I have sworn, saith Yahweh, and you've not withheld your son, and you have obeyed my voice. This is an incredible testimony to the identity of the Malak Yahweh, the angel of the Lord, is the messenger that God the Father would send into this world. He was working actively in Old Testament times long before he became a baby in Bethlehem. Let's go to the case of Moses, Exodus chapter 3. If you're Jewish, there's a couple of heavy-duty names that you just don't treat lightly ever. Abraham, of course. Uh, King David, of course. But when you say Moses, um, we're talking big time here. You understand me? Moses is a great lawgiver. We, we don't fool around with Moses. Moses is the one God used to give us the Torah. Uh, which is basically or uniquely the first five books of the Bible, but can also refer to the entire uh, Tanakh. It can also refer to just the Ten Commandments. It has a lot of applications. Uh, Torah can refer to any commandment. Uh, I think this is stretching it a bit, but uh, if you were raised in a Jewish home and your mother didn't like what you were doing and she wanted you to do something else, she would shout at you, It's a mitzvah! Now the word mitzvah means commandment. So you see, what she wants to do is put a little authority behind what she's asking you to do. She knows it's not in the Bible. She hasn't got a verse to prove her point. But it's just a mitzvah, okay? That means you do what your mama wants. You understand? Okay, now we got it. Now, so what we have here, um, we have, in fact, the authority of God himself coming out through this angel of the Lord. And um, to Moses... Uh, he's the author of the Torah, the first five books, which continually tell us about Yahweh's voice speaking, commanding, telling us things. And so when you read something out of that life of Moses, it, it carries a certain impact uh, to a Jewish heart that, that maybe isn't that always that obvious to some of us. In Exodus 3, beginning of verse 1, we learn that Moses... After he had fled Egypt, he kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert, came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. How could uh, Moses lead the children of Israel out of Egypt and come right to Mount Sinai? Well, because he had been there before. He spent 40 years on the backside of the desert. He knew it like the back of his hand. No problem at all. I can see Moses in the desert yelling at him. No, not that way. Over here. I've been here before. Follow me. You know. Now, I may have added a little to the Word of God there, but we do know, we do know that when Moses complained to God, that's exactly what he said. These people, they're so rebellious. They don't follow me. They don't do what I tell them. I can see him chasing down, you know, sheep and goats and put them over here. No, we gotta go through that little crevice right over there. I know what I'm doing. Follow me now. Okay. It was really frustrating. But he had been there before. See. He knew this area quite well. Because something happened at the foot of that mountain that changed his life. He was talented. Very eloquent speaker, though he tried to <laughs> tell God he wasn't. He was kind of stupid. He was trained in all the... Uh, educational advantages of ancient Egypt. Uh, Acts 7.22 tells us that. He knew all their wisdom. He could speak eloquently. But when he started to complain to God, he said, oh, I'm slow of speech and tongue. And that's when God got ticked. Uh, my translation, but God really got upset with him with that one. Like, who do you think I am? I mean, do I not know whether you can speak or not? But God was so mad at him, he judged him and told him that Aaron would do all the talking. 
You know, I feel sorry for Aaron. Aaron really never came up with anything original in his life. The poor guy, can you imagine going into Pharaoh? God wouldn't let Moses talk directly to Pharaoh. He'd always have to tell Aaron, and Aaron would speak to Pharaoh. You know, and he'd tell Aaron, tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Aaron says, let my people go. <laughs> Pharaoh says, I'm not going to do that. He turns to Moses. I'm not, can you see Moses a little irritated? I heard it, I heard it. You know, it's God's little judgment on him. He wasn't allowed to talk to Pharaoh because he, he lied to God. But anyway, uh, one of the greatest things that ever happened in his life was this event at the foot of Mount Horeb. Look at verse 2. The angel, not an angel, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire. Well, right away you know something's very interesting here because that's God's way of demonstrating his presence the devouring fire, the pillar of fire. Our God is a consuming fire, the Bible says. He's not merely fire, but He can appear in a flame of fire. Now it came out of the midst of a bush, and He looked, and behold, a bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed, so that was pretty unusual. I like what one writer who has surveyed that area archaeologically said, it was a miracle he found a bush. <laughs> now, I have also been through that area, and the Sinai is just desolate of sagebrush. Even. It's one of the most barren deserts in the entire world. So the fact that there was a bush was unusual. And the bush is on fire. Moses probably was a little upset about that because the bush was probably one of the few things he could have used to get a little relief from the heat of the sun, and here it's on fire, you know. So anyway, but he turns to see why the bush isn't burnt. Verse 4 says, when the, what? What does it say? The Lord saw. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Verse 2, the angel of the Lord appeared. But in verse 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. He said, here I, here, here am I. People said, oh, come on. He's talking to a bush. Hey, if a voice came out of a bush that was on fire and talked to you, I think you'd listen. You probably would freeze and panic. Y yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, whoever, whatever this is. Draw not nigh hither. Don't come any closer. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. You know, God said the same thing to Joshua as you can find in Joshua chapter 5. And again, it was the captain of the host of the Lord, the angel of the Lord that appeared to Joshua, told him, take your shoes off. The place where you're standing is holy ground. And the Lord, Yahweh, spoke to Joshua, only it was the angel of the Lord or the captain of the Lord of hosts. I didn't even put that one down here. A lot of interesting things. Look what he said, verse 6. Moreover, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon, what does it say? God. You understand, you have to do some sort of uh, spiritual gymnastics to get out of the problem of this text. The angel of the Lord is called Yahweh, who turns aside, to, or calls to him. God, he's called. He tells him to take off your shoes, because the place where you're standing is holy ground. There's a little chorus that I like that was written on this little fact about taking your shoes off because the place you're standing on holy ground. It says, um, This is holy ground. We're standing on holy ground. Anybody know that song? For the Lord is here present and where He is is holy. You know, it's a good point, a good reminder. And who is talking to us? the angel of the Lord. It's pretty powerful. Over in chapter 14, at the time that, uh, you know, they got out of Egypt and um, the Lord fought for them and defeated the armies of the Egyptians, in uh, chapter 14, verse 19, it says, and the angel of God. There's one of those six usages of the angel of God. W look at this. Which went before the camp of Israel. So remember in Zechariah, when at the Battle of Armageddon, they said, God will make those feeble Jews like the angel of God who went before them. What's it referring to? The fact that who led them through the wilderness? Well, it wasn't just Moses. 
And certainly after he got out of Mount Horeb, he needed help. The angel of God led them. And here it says, The angel of God which went before the camp removed and went behind them. The pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. Yet that pillar of cloud and that pillar of fire is described as being the glory of Yahweh. In chapter 40 of Exodus, this is not in your notes, so you probably should add it. In chapter 40 of Exodus, the last chapter, verse 34, it says, Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of Yahweh, the glory of the Lord, filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because of the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. When the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord, Yahweh, was upon the tabernacle by day, fire was on it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel, throughout all their journeys. Now, class, it's obvious. The angel of the Lord, according to Exodus 14:19, is the one who went before them, who was in that pillar of cloud, yet... According to Exodus 40, it was the glory of Yahweh that was in that pillar of cloud. So the uniqueness of the angel of the Lord is one of the prominent reasons why we speak of the pre-existence of Jesus Christ. Uh, the case of Balaam, uh, turn to Numbers chapter 22. Balaam was a prophet of God, and uh, he found out it doesn't pay to compromise um, he's being pressured by the king of Moab to curse Israel, um, but he's finding out that uh, God's in control, even of his own mouth. And uh, he has an experience with a, a donkey where the donkey turns around and talks to him. Now, that'll shake you up a bit. But when I read that story, I like to say, hey, if God used Balaam's ass, he can use you. God can use anybody he wants, anytime he wants. So don't think too highly of yourself. Numbers 22, verse 20. Um, it says, God came unto Balaam. Verse 22, God's anger was kindled, and the angel of the Lord stood in the way. Verse 23, the ass, the donkey, saw the angel of the Lord with the sword drawn. Verse 24, the angel of the Lord stood there. Verse 25, the ass saw the angel of the Lord. Uh, verse 26, the angel of the Lord went further. The ass saw the angel of the Lord, verse 27. Verse 28, and the Lord. Here we drop the angel up. And the Lord, Yahweh, opened the mouth of the ass. Verse 31, the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in his way. Verse 32, he bowed down to him, by the way. And the angel of the Lord said, Why have you smitten your ass? Because thy way is perverse before me. That's God's message. Balaam said unto the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. He's now confessing his sin. Verse 35, angel of the Lord said, Go with the men and speak only what I tell you to speak. And again in the story as you continue to read, God will tell him what to speak. Verse 5 of chapter 23, The Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth. The point is, the angel of the Lord is identified also as the Lord in that story. Turn to Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2. Is anybody getting the idea that he might have existed before he was a baby in Bethlehem? Judges chapter 2. A book that says, every man did that which is right in his own eyes. America, chapter 2. And uh, we have a lot of... That's a wonderful book, Judges. A lot of lessons in that book. Great lessons. To Gideon, as well as to the children of Israel, we see the message of the angel of the Lord. In Judges 2, to the children of Israel, it says, An angel of the Lord came up. So here it's not real clear. But look what he said. I made you to go up out of Egypt. I have brought you. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Make no leave. You have not obeyed my voice. Verse 2. I will not. So forth. It came to pass when, here it is, the angel of the Lord spake these words. People not only wept, they sacrificed unto the Lord. 
Now, that's a clear passage, but turn over to uh, chapter 6, the case of Gideon. In verse 11, here it says, There came an angel of the Lord. But in verse 12, it says, The angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said, The Lord is with thee. And he says, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why is this fallen? Why did the Lord bring us up? And verse 14 says, The Lord, Yahweh, looked upon him. Man, that is really amazing. Verse 20, The angel of God. There's another usage of those six times, angel of God. Verse 21, the angel of the Lord, um, twice used there. And Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord. He said, Alas, O Lord God, because I've seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And Yahweh said, Peace unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. And he built an altar unto Yahweh and called it Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. Isn't that interesting? How many times you can see this. Flip over to chapter 13 of Judges. This is the parents of Samson. Manoah and his wife. His wife was barren. They had no child. And um, in verse 6, a woman said what she had, had happened to her in verse 3. The angel of the Lord had appeared unto a woman. She told her she was going to conceive. She said the angel of the Lord. And his countenance was like the countenance of the angel of God and angel of God. Very terrible. Well, how would she know? But whatever it was, it really impressed her. Verse 9, God hearkened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again. Some people say, well, that's two different things there. Well, keep going. Verse 13, the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, of all that I sweat said unto the woman, let her beware. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee. We'd really like to, you know, talk some more with you. <laughs> Verse 16, the angel of the Lord said, you can't do it, but you offer burnt offering. Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. Manoah said unto the angel Lord, What is thy name? When all this comes to pass, we can honor you. He said, Why askest thou my name? See, and it is wonderful or secret. The word wonderful in Hebrew means incomprehensible. You can't understand my name. His name, says Isaiah 9, 6, is wonderful. Story's not over. Verse 22, he said, we shall surely die because we have seen what? We have seen God. Folks, the angel of the Lord is identified as being both Yahweh and Elohim, both Lord and God in the Old Testament. It is the angel of the Lord that appeared to Hagar. We never even looked at that one back in Genesis 16. A very clear reference Genesis chapter 16. The angel of the Lord found her and said, uh, the angel of the Lord, verse 9, angel of the Lord said, I will multiply thy seed. The Lord gave that message to her. You'll bear a son. His name will be Ishmael because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. Verse 13, she called the name of the Lord that spoke with her. Thou God seest me. Wow. The angel of the Lord called God there too. So is Jesus in existence before he became a baby in Bethlehem? If you're not sure about that, you will definitely miss that section on the test. Amen? You are dismissed. The class was dismissed for intermission. Now begins second session. All right, back to our discussion about the pre-existence of Christ, looking at the uniqueness of the angel of the Lord. Now, we've said all we've had, all we've said so far, basically proving that this messenger, this Malak of Yahweh, this angel of the Lord, is in fact the Lord or God. But we haven't really proven that it's Jesus. Turn to Malachi, or Malachi, the Italian prophet. <laughs> Chapter 3. Malachi. Chapter 3. Now here is a, 
a very messianic passage. In fact, in many uh, commentaries on the Passover uh, that you will buy in a bookstore along about that time, you will find this passage mentioned because there is a little uh, act that Jewish people do at the Passover about going to the door to see if Elijah the prophet is here. It's kind of based on him, and he is known as the messenger. The word is malach, same word translated angel. But in this particular verse, we have a second malach. Let's take a look at it. Behold, I, go back to 2.16, the Lord Yahweh, the God of Israel, saith, Behold, I, this is the Lord God of Israel talking, I will send my Malak, angel, messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Now go over to chapter 4, just keep your finger there for a moment. In chapter 4, verse 5, it picks up the same thing. Behold, I will send you, who? Elijah, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh. So we know, and all Jews agree, and all Christians as well, that this messenger, number one, is Elijah the prophet. We also know that it's applied to John the Baptist. Uh, a lot of people use this as a attack against the Bible's accuracy, uh, not really understanding what Jesus said. Jesus said, if uh, you would have repented at the preaching of John the Baptist, and this is Elijah. Well, that's a true statement even if he was talking about me, but nobody's ever figured it out. That is, those who criticize. God could say, if you would repent at the preaching of David, then this is Elijah. If you understand anybody who's turning the hearts of the people back to the Lord and the hearts of fathers back to the children is coming in the spirit and power of Elijah. Now, in the technical sense, it was also possible, in terms of the credentials of the Messiah and accepting him, that if the nation had not rejected him, but in fact had received him, then John the Baptist would have been the fulfillment of Elijah the prophet coming back. First of all, is Elijah going to come back? Absolutely. Is he still going to come back? Are Jews right at Passover to uh, picture that in their Passover celebration? Absolutely. Elijah is still going to come back. Now, I happen to believe he's one of the two witnesses in Revelation 11. And the other one's Moses. And a lot of people think it's Enoch and Enoch and Elijah, but they'll find out I'm right when they get to heaven. <laughs> Moses and Elijah. I mean, from a Jewish point of view, who else? Come on. You know. Anyway, Elijah is to come back before the coming of that great and terrible day of the Lord. The battle of Armageddon, the setting up of the kingdom, okay? So Elijah is going to come. Now, would it have been possible, listen carefully, that John the Baptist could have been an appearance of Elijah the prophet? Sure, it's possible. Why is it possible? What makes us so sure that Elijah the prophet, who died and now is spirit, could not come and inhabit the body of John the Baptist? Now, I know this sounds really weird, but let me just stretch it a little further. I love to do this. I cause more controversies. But you know, the, the, we gotta think. You know, a lot of times nobody's challenged us to think. Let's think a little bit. You remember at the resurrection, two men in white apparel. Isn't it possible? Just a thought. Since Zechariah's prophecy said that these two who would be connected to the messianic uh, hope uh, were two anointed ones that stand before the Lord of glory, isn't it possible that the two men in white apparel were in fact Moses and Elijah? Oh, well, let me put it another way. Who was on the Mount of Transfiguration? I think it was Mount Hermon uh, where it happened. In Matthew 17, it says that two guys appeared with Jesus, and they were even recognized. Now, either they wore signs saying, hey, I'm Moses, so Peter, James, and John would know, and the other guy, I'm Elijah, you can tell by the length of my beard. You know, I, Hey, come on, they must have done something. It, or the Lord said, here they are. You know, I don't know, but it says they knew that it was Moses and Elijah. Peter was so ballistic, he wanted to build three big tabernacles for them. 
But uh, God doesn't share His glory with anyone, so He got a little squelched on that one. But anyway, who appeared? Moses and Elijah. Stop battling with these people who try to trick you in this passage. Is it possible for Elijah, this spirit one, whose body was in the grave awaiting for the resurrection, is it possible for a spirit to come back and appear as a human being? Absolutely. It has happened many times. It will happen again. I remind you the angels are spirit beings, and they can appear as men. I remind you the devil and all the demons are spirit beings, and they can transform themselves into ministers of righteousness and teachers and prophets who are false. Hey, wake up, people. Don't let people use this argument against you. It was very possible that Elijah could have, in fact, inhabited the body of John the Baptist. Now, because they rejected him, that wasn't so. Is Elijah still coming? Yes, and he will appear. He's still coming. Now, what about the ascension? Jesus ascended to heaven. The Bible says again, two men in white apparel. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up to heaven? The same Jesus come again. The messianic connection is too powerful. They appear again. I, I just think maybe it's the same two appearing all the time. Hello. Is it a possibility your Sunday school story was wrong? Is it possible? Would you just grant the probability of it? I don't want to become dogmatic. I just want us to think a little bit more. Okay, now let's keep reading. First one, Elijah, John the Baptist, the one who prepared the way of the Lord. Isaiah 40 talks about that. Now the next statement is, And the Lord, Yahweh, not Adonai, Or is it Adonai? Here becomes a great battle. Talking with one of the gentlemen in the break here about Jewish people grow up with a, a feeling that the, it isn't Malak Yahweh, it's Malak Adonai, a messenger of the Lord. And um, they see, you know, Adonai is an earthly Lord. Jehovah Witnesses like to capitalize on this. And with a JW teacher... Uh, who's now a fundamental Baptist pastor, um, he and I argued for about two years until he came to believe that Yeshua is who he claimed. But anyway, he uh, used this verse all the time. The first Lord is Adonai. Now watch this carefully. And the Lord, Adonai, whom ye seek. Now let me ask you a question. Do you believe that Jesus is an earthly Lord? Well, I'll put it to you another way. Do you think he's going to be Lord of anything ru ruling on the earth? Of course. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. So what's the problem here? It isn't the problem that he's called an earthly Lord. The problem is, is he called Yahweh? Now watch this. And Adonai, whom you seek, shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger, again it's Malak, angel, of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts, Yahweh. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? He's like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He'll sit as a refining and purifying of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto Yahweh an offering in righteousness. I like to say to people, you can't have your ice cream and cake too on this. Here's the point. No one that I know of, be he J.W., Jewish teacher, or Protestant minister, or Catholic, or anyone else, no one believes that the words of verse 2 are not speaking of Yahweh. Who can stand before Him? In fact, the, this statement is used several times in the Bible, including the Psalms. Psalm 130 says, if, if He marks iniquities, who can stand in front of Him? Who's the purifier? Who's the refiner? It's Yahweh. It's the Lord God. He's the only one who does that. Now, you see, they love to make a little switch here on you. But you can't get away with it. We're talking about the one who is coming. And he's called Adonai, whom you seek. Malak, the messenger, the angel of the covenant. He's going to come. And who can abide his coming? Who will stand when he appears? He's like the refiner's fire. He will purify the sons of Levi. So you understand, this Adonai, 
this Malak, this messenger, is in fact the same as the one who will do all the re- refining and purifying. So we got a difficult statement, but we're not even done there. Look at verse 6. He continues speaking and says, For I am the what? Lord, and here it's Yahweh. Sorry, JWs. Sorry, my Jewish rabbinical friends. The one who is coming is declared to be Yahweh. I change not. That's the one passage we use on the immutability, immutability of God. That is the attribute of God that makes him God that he never changes. We all change. God never changes. And yet it, in the context, it's a reference to Yeshua. You should have known that, though, because Hebrews said, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the unchangeable Hamashiach Messiah. Everybody still with me? So, is the Messiah... Oh, and by the way, we don't have to worry about this being a reference to Jesus, because in fact it's used in in the Bible for him in the book of Revelation. So we know that we're on good ground here. But even excluding the New Testament evidence, we have clear statements here that this angel of the covenant of God's promise is in fact an Adonai, will be an earthly Lord, one who is coming, one who will purify and cleanse, and is Yahweh who never changes. Hey, time for holy grunt. Hallelujah. Praise hallelujah. Amen. He's our Lord. Okay. I mean, sitting there, oh, heavy, heavy. Come on. Now, if you think that one teaches the pre-existence, look at this. The understanding of the Lord of hosts. You you cannot know how many times I have argued this with JWs. It's almost like a lost cause. Their minds get so blind. I, I've learned through the years to kind of skip the arguments and go for the penetrating questions. So rather than let them control the conversation, I like to ask the questions. Besides, it's more Jewish anyway. But anyway, you like to ask the questions. So one of the questions is, you know that uh, phrase, the Lord of hosts? Is that word Lord Adonai or Yahweh? See, that way we cut out all the middle ground discussion and all the little gymnastics to try to prove that it's only Adonai, an earthly lord, because it says lord of hosts, which means armies, of course, so it's an earthly lord. Well, then you would expect to see Adonai and not Yahweh. But in fact, it's the exact opposite. Now, the lord of hosts is used 236 times, so we're going to look up every... No, we're not. But it would be a great study. And there are four... Here's what I want you to know. Excuse me. Everybody pay attention. Test time. Four things about the Lord of hosts. And when you get these down, you can answer any cultist at your door. Four things. One, this Lord of hosts is the Redeemer. We'll prove that to you here in a moment. Two, He is the King. And three, He is the God of the armies of Israel. And four, he's the commander of the army of the Lord. Now, let's go to Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6. So if I asked on the test, how does the Bible use the term the Lord of hosts? To what is he likened? Redeemer, King, God, Commander. Isaiah 44. One of the, uh, although I don't always require this, one of the practices that I would get involved with if I were you, I try to do this myself, is to connect at least one passage with the point that you're trying to get down. So this becomes a part of your system. So if somebody comes up to you and debates the subject, you got the point. Yeah, he's the Redeemer. And you got one verse. Isaiah 44, 6. So I try to, when I... Uh, put this together to make it a part of my life. I try to connect those verses. That's very important when you're talking to somebody to turn immediately to the passage. So if you want to prove the Redeemer is Yahweh of armies, you have to have a verse. Isaiah 44, 6. Thus saith the Lord, that's the word Yahweh in Hebrew, the King of Israel. 
Everybody's in agreement. JWs are in agreement. Jews are in agreement. Yes, Yahweh is the King of Israel. And His Redeemer. And right away, that's Hamashiach. We know that. He is the Messiah. The Redeemer, the one who will save us. Yes, we understand that. Well, it says, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. And I can't tell you how many JWs, but they all do it. They say, well, there's two words for Lord. One is Yahweh and one is Adonai. And they keep going. And everybody who doesn't know always goes, oh, I see. You know, like, oh boy, that's something I haven't been taught. See, they never really told you whether it was Adonai in the text. Because it's not. It's the word Yahweh both times. We got two Yahwehs in the same verse. Let me tell you what verse the JWs are going to quote to you. Psalm 110.1. David said, the Lord, Yahweh, said unto my Lord, Adonai, sit here at my right hand. And they quote, they'll show you the New Testament, that's quoted of Jesus. So you see, Jesus is nothing but an earthly Lord. They get away with it, because nobody stops them and says, Oh, then he's always Adonai. He's never Yahweh. And they will politely say, well, we're not trying to be offensive, but the Messiah is never called Yahweh in the Old Testament. And because you memorize references with your points, you say, well then please explain to me this problem in Isaiah 44, 6. We have two Yahwehs here. In fact, the very term you said was the Messiah, the Redeemer. In fact, he's called Yahweh of armies, Lord of hosts. How do you get out of that? They are, most of them that I've talked, they're not very knowledgeable, really. They're only knowledgeable according to the training they receive. Just like you when you go out witnessing. You often just memorize what somebody told you rather than really know it yourself. So they don't really know. And so they usually say, this is like classic answer. What translation are you reading from? (laughs) See, now they're taught to do this because then they can get on the translation problem. And they got you away from the situation. And I always say to them, well, let's just do it in Hebrew. Uh, I think we got to go. The next thing I always tell the J.D., why don't you lead us in a word of prayer before you go? You see, in their training, they're told never to pray in front of you if you're not a J.W. You're a pagan. It's an abomination to God. And they always say, well, we'd rather not. Oh, I thought you people were religious. Well, we, we, we yeah, but you mean you don't care enough for me to pray for me? Why don't you pray for me that I become a Jehovah Witness? I don't understand. I mean, you should pray right now. If you don't pray for me, then you're liars and deceivers and hypocrites, and I want you out of my house. And they're like, well, well, I, uh, blah, 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 There are different ways to witness, of course. Perhaps you prefer, you might. Prefer my wife's method, which is to serve cookies and coffee and act sweet. Which, of course, is why we got them in in the first place. So you really need both methods, really. Okay. All right. In Isaiah 6, we have that great vision of Isaiah. I saw the Lord. Boy, is that a great one. I love that passage. The year that King Uzziah died, he was a leper the last 16 years of his life and had to shout unclean to people. That will help you understand this vision. He was a good man. Jotham, his son, reigned as a co-regent with him for about 16 years. When King Uzziah died, it was a critical moment in Israel's history. Jotham's son, Ahaz, had some problems. He said, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. Adonai, earthly Lord, sitting on a throne, (laughs) high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. This is an unusual earthly Lord. We have the angels there crying, Holy, holy, holy is the, verse 3, Lord, and here it's Yahweh. The whole earth is full of His glory. Verse 5, Woe is me, I'm undone, I'm a man of unclean lips. He's identifying with Uzziah, this good king to whom he often preached. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the 
what? King, the Yahweh of hosts. One thing a lot of Jewish people as well as uh, JWs don't want to say is they don't want to call the Father Adonai. They don't want that at all. Well, you got a problem here. Is the Adonai that's sitting on the throne the Father? Well, they got to say that. You aren't going to give this glory to Jesus. That's for sure in a Jewish context, rabbinical teaching. Well, then he's called Yahweh of hosts, the Father. They, they won't mind that. But he's called the King, Yahweh of hosts. And they won't mind that. He's the King. No problem. We, we understand that. Well, how do you explain that he's called Adonai in verse 1? Uh, I don't, I don't know. Tradition. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's a manuscript problem. I, I don't know. Do you understand me? To me, the Bible is so wonderful. The details of it are absolutely incredible. Here God gives you a situation you can't get out of. Most everyone reading this would think, I saw Yahweh sitting on his throne. Praise be to Yahweh. Wait a minute. You saw Adonai, an earthly lord. Now he's called Yahweh of hosts. He's called the king We've got an earthly Lord called the King Yahweh of hosts. What a passage. Man, I love that. Anybody getting excited? First Samuel seventeen forty five. First Samuel seventeen forty five. What father who loves the Lord and teaches the Bible to his children has not told, told the story of David and Goliath? And always did it dramatically. My kids always wanted me to play Goliath. I never could figure that out. <laughs> Lord with all capitals. just kind of. My oh, you have an English Bible that does that. Yes, the Old yeah. King James does that. Yeah. Lord, all capitals, is usually Yahweh, and small letters is Adonai. So how do they differentiate the two? Translations of the God and Lord, angel, God and Lord. Not very well. I mean, the word, how do they come up with two different words for the one Hebrew word? No, there's not. No, and, and the angel of God is Elohim. Angel of the Lord is Yahweh. Yeah. First Samuel 17, 45. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, with a spear, with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of Yahweh of armies, the God of the armies of Israel whom thou hast defiled. Defied. Folks, this is one of the greatest texts you can ever use to prove that the Lord of hosts is in fact the God of the armies of Israel. And that opens up your brain to a lot of other passages, of course. One more. Go to Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. Verse 13. It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. Remember the story of Balaam in Numbers? The angel of the Lord had a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? That's a smart question. He said, No, I'm captain of the host of the Lord, of Yahweh, am I now come. Joshua fell on his face and did worship and said, What saith my Lord unto his servants? And the captain of the Lord's, Yahweh's army, said unto Joshua, Look who's saying what. A lot of people, J.W. has tried to prove this proves that Jesus is just a commander. He's not the Lord. Well, he's certainly an unusual commander. He told Joshua to take his shoes off because the place where he stands is holy, and that's only said by Yahweh. And then if you keep reading, Jericho was straightly shut up because children of no one out, and Yahweh said unto Joshua. Now he just asked, what do you say to me? And he said, take your foot off. Take your shoe off your foot, not your foot off. Take your shoe off. And then the Lord, Yahweh, talks to him. He just asked him, 
tell me what you want. And he answers, only the Bible says it was Yahweh talking. So once again, we have the commander of the Lord of hosts as another peg in our whole uh, argument here. I think one of the interesting things, though, is the use of plural pronouns. Uh, from Genesis 1, 26, it says, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. In chapter 11 at the Tower of Babel, let us go down and confound their language. In Isaiah 6, 8, where we were a moment ago, Isaiah said, here am I, but that was an answer. The Lord said, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Now, the problem of the plural pronoun is really, really a difficult one. Um, here's some of the arguments. Well, the reason why we have that plural there is because Elohim is a plural noun, even though it's referring to God. Well, that's interesting, except that in the passages, the Lord, Yahweh, said, let us go down. Um, many of the Jewish writers, in fact, most of them, argue that he's talking to the angels. With one exception, they don't like it in the story of creation, because if you're Jewish, God alone creates. So they don't like God saying to the angels, hey, let's us make man. I mean, they don't believe the angels were involved in the process, but they kind of like that in Genesis 11. Let's us all go down, because he's the Lord of hosts, armies, so he's taking all of his angels down with him. So when it says, let us, that's where they get it. But they don't like it in Genesis 1. So in Genesis 1, the average Hebrew commentary on that says that this is what is called a majestic plural. What's a majestic plural? It means really big. Okay. Um, let us, I'm a really big person, create man in our a really big uh, image. And when I do that to my Jewish rabbinical friends, which I have done, they always say, you're crazy, you're crazy. You know? I said, but it's crazy to hear you say it's a majestic plural. What good does that do? What, what does it do? The plural is even used as possession of the word image. I mean, come on, what are you, what are you talking about here? The Lord our God is one Lord. They say, they always repeat the Shema back to me, even if it's not the Shabbat. That's Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. They go right back to that. And I said, hey, quit putting me on. You know, they get excited, which I like, by the way. I like the opposition to get a little excited. That means we can continue this discussion a little further. It's when they're apathetic and walk away, you think, oh man, I lost that one. So anyway, the Lord our God is one Lord. I said, hey, quit putting me on. You know and I know a cause. We use it every day. It means more than one. And they always turn back and say, give one example. And I say, sure. Genesis 2, 24. The Bible says a man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and the two shall be a hath, one flesh. Apparently two could be one in some sense. So God has to be more than one. And they always, they always say, more than one what? Like this is the heavy duty. <laughs> Folks, there is only one God. There never has been more than one God. There are not three gods. We do not believe that. There is only one God. But this God can manifest himself as Father and as Son and as Holy Spirit without ever doing any injustice to the unity which all three of those persons enjoy as one God. Is everybody listening? This is really critical understanding. Many people believe that, uh, you know, when you say, what is Christianity based on? They always say, you know, the death and resurrection of Christ. Jesus is a central issue. There are a lot of us who have done, you know, a lot of theological studies who come back to saying, perhaps the real watershed outside of whether the Bible's the Word of God, of course, but the real watershed might be the triunity of God. Because if you get messed up there, it's going to mess up who Jesus is. It's going to mess up 
the meaning of the death and the resurrection of Christ. So the root issue of Christianity may in fact be the triunity of God, which means that the JWs and our Jewish friends are correct in saying that that is the real issue between us and you evangelical Christians. See, I don't fight them on that. I agree with them on that. I say, you know, you're exactly right. Then they go on to say, you guys made it three gods. Oh, excuse me. We don't believe in three gods. We only believe in one God. And see, they're correct. That doctrine affects everything else. I would not build the case for the presence of my Lord, Jesus Christ, in the Old Testament on plural pronouns alone. It, you need all the arguments. But let's just for a moment to kind of wrap up this point. Look at the unity of New Testament writers. And take the Gospel of John, for instance. Now, anybody with some Hebrew background knows that John is definitely Jewish. In fact, you, it's one of the easier books you can take and go from Greek back to Hebrew. Uh, it's just Jewish. It's filled with Jewish statements and uh, phrases and uh, contrasts. and uh, it, It's very Jewish, John is. In John 1, 1, he tells us the word was God. And I won't go over that again. And he tells us in verse 14, he became flesh, not he was flesh. It's genomai, a change of condition, which is the key text assuming the preexistence in the New Testament. He became flesh, which means he was in existence previously to becoming flesh. Now, in chapter 6, just to show you, few things here. In chapter 6, verse 51, Jesus said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Pretty strong talk. Verse 62, what and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was, what? Before. Do you understand the New Testament is agreeing to his pre-existence? Jesus said, I was a living bread that came down from heaven. I was in heaven before. And in verse 62, what if you see the Son of Man ascend up where he, what? Was before. So see, the New Testament clearly teaches the pre-existence of Christ. Uh, in chapter 8, verse 58, a tremendous statement to his pre-existence. Might be good to remember this one for a future day. John 8, 58. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Now, if there ever was a statement of pre-existence, there it is. Now, we may question what he meant. The Jews didn't question it. They picked up stones to stone him for blasphemy. Now, let's think about it. He, um, he could have said, Before Abraham was, I was. He could have. It would have been true. Now, Abraham lived about 2,100 years before Christ. Before Abraham existed, I was. I was there. And the Jews, you're not even yet 50 years old, and you're saying, you, hey, come on. But he didn't actually say that. He said, before Abraham was, I am. You see, the reason the Jews, they wouldn't throw stones at a guy who's crazy. They will throw stones at a guy who blasphemes. You see, they knew that Jesus was claiming to be the Yahweh of the Bible, right then and there. There wasn't any doubt in their mind. Now, how'd they get that? Well, because every Jewish home teaches what the name of God is that happened at the time of Moses. So when he said, I am that I am, it means who I am, I am, and nothing you're going to say or do is ever going to change that. I'm the unchangeable Lord. Whoever I am, I still am, even if you never get it. But when Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, they knew exactly what he said. And they picked up stones to stone him for blasphemy. Even if you don't like that, you have to agree, he does indicate pre-existence by the statement. In chapter 17, verse 5, Jesus is praying to his father, his high priestly prayer, he says, Now, O Father, glorify Thou me with Thine own self, watch this, with the glory 
which I had with thee before the world was. Now he claims to be in existence, sharing the glory of his Father before creation. But we even have a time factor now in terms of pre-existence. In verse 24, he mentions again, Thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. In Philippians 2, it tells us to have this mind, which is also in Christ, who being in the form, the morphe of God, did not think it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took on the form of servant, made in likeness as man, fashioned as a man, and humbled himself. The point is, he was in existence in the morphe of God, the form of God, before he became a man. So you see, again, pre-existence is assumed in Philippians 2, 5-7. to Colossians 1, 17 leaves no doubt. He is before all things. Colossians 1.17. And that's the argument. One other thing that I'd like to mention um, before we get off his pre-existence is his preeminence over all things. And I kind of started with it uh, in our last time together and I want to end with it. Would you take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians? One of the most wonderful studies, and we have only scratched the surface, In our course, we have to move from doctrinal matter to doctrinal matter about Christ, but in fact, we could spend probably the entire course on this. It is such a heavy-duty matter. There is a volume that is out of print that you can sometimes find in an old bookstore. It was reprinted a few years back, but that apparently is out of print, by Hengstenberg, uh, dealing with Christology in the Old Testament. It's absolutely fabulous. Big beast. Ephesians 1, verse 20. Talking about God's mighty power, which he wrought or worked in Christ, in Messiah, when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, hath put all things under his feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Would you just casually say the Bible thinks he's number one? Preeminent over everything that has ever been made. He is the creator of it all. Colossians 1, 18 and 19. He is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Class, Colossians 1.19, I want you to look at. In most English translations, the word the Father is in italics. Why? Because it's not in the original text. Let's read it as it is in the original text. The subject of the sentence is all the fullness. All the fullness was pleased to dwell in him. It's a little different because all the fullness can be like a tangible entity that the Father now puts in Jesus and you can water down what's being said by that. No, all the fullness is who God is. Everything God is. And all the fullness, namely God himself, was pleased to dwell in that physical body of the Lord Jesus. Go to Colossians 2, verse 9, just to reemphasize that. Verse 9, Colossians 2, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, in a body. Now look at the next statement. And ye, not thee, but ye. The old King James is the only help here. All modern English do not help you here. There's not one believer here who is complete like Jesus. But that is taught by a lot of false doctrine. No, you are not going to be God. You never will be God. You are man, woman. You are not God. Never will be. Exclamation point. So all those Christian meetings on Christian television where they shout out, you are God and quote this verse, they're misquoting the verse. It isn't 
you as an individual. It's ye, plural. The body of Christ, all the believers, are complete. It is true that the word complete in verse 10 is the same root as fullness in verse 9. We are, as a group, filled up in Him. If all the fullness of God is in His physical body, and we are in Him, then we are obviously filled up too. He is the head of all principality and power. He's preeminent in everything. That's kind of some heavy-duty stuff there. But let me just tell you this. All the fullness of God never dwelt in any one particular physical body except Jesus. There never was anyone else. But all of our bodies put together, we form the body of the church. The fullness of the Lord is expressed. His life is expressed. What does that mean? That means that I might know something about Him that you don't know. Or I might express and reflect something in Him that you're not expressing. And you express something about Him that I don't know. And together we all learn and we grow and we edify one another and grow in Him who is the head of it all. Everybody okay? I think we've had enough today. (laughs) This is one of those examples where your head hurts and only lunch will help. (laughs) Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your blessed word and for the fact that our Lord is being honored and exalted. He is above everyone and everything. He is Lord, Lord of all. And may that be applied in every one of our lives. We'd stop trying to take the controls and run things. May we fall at His feet and worship Him. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. In the name of our Messiah. Amen.